My previous speaker, uh, Professor Schanz, already mentioned the crucial role of the endothelium, which is damaged by flow and pressure in congenital heart disease, leading to a serum leak with degradation of extracellular matrix proteins, as well as release of growth factors and mediators, and finally leading to vessel obstruction and development of um, plexiform lesions. In my talk, I will focus on the clinical aspects of end-stage pulmonary hypertension in congenital heart disease, or with other words, on Eisenmenger. This figure shows pathophysiological changes during the development of Eisenmenger syndrome. Formation of plexiform lesions lead to a substantial elevation of pulmonary vascular resistance with reduction of pulmonary blood flow, and consequently to a sustained reduction in oxygen supply. And the chronic cyanosis has an extremely negative impact on the whole organism. The, as a matter of fact, patients with Eisenmenger are at multiple and special risks. Among them are not only specific heart problems like arrhythmia or sudden cardiac death and heart failure, but also infections, brain abscesses, coagulation disorders, chronic renal failure, etc., etc. As a consequence of this multiple organ disease, exercise capacity is severely afflicted. This study of the Royal Brunton Group in, in London looked at the exercise capacity in adult congenital heart disease in correlation with the impact of underlying diagnosis. What we can see is that the lowest and worst functional ability is observed in Eisenmenger physiology. These patients with congenital heart disease are among our sickest. It's no wonder that although short-term survival is relatively good, overall life expectancy is reduced in Eisenmenger. The data from the Royal Brompton Group recapitulates 170 patients with a mean age of 37 years, and it is easily seen that the survival at about 50 years of age is 74%, and it is even worse in more complex lesions. How can we treat the Eisenmenger? Our first mission is targeted therapy. A couple of years ago, a randomized um, controlled trial in Eisenmenger was performed, as everybody knows here in the auditorium, and it was performed on 54 uh, patients, and the main result of the study is shown here. After six minutes, the six-minute walk distance after 16 weeks of therapy increased in, in summary of, of over 50 meters in patients with Eisenmenger syndrome. And in, while this initial study was, the RIS-5 study was conducted over only 16 weeks, the open-label extension study observes the patients over 40 weeks of treatment. It is nicely shown that the positive effect of, uh, of targeted therapy was um, preserved, persisted in the treatment group, and patients formerly on placebo had also an increase in walking distance with an effect of about 60 meters for the whole group. Interestingly, there was no effect on saturations, as we would expect if a selective pulmonary vasodilator is used to increase pulmonary blood flow. Since then, several studies have been performed with different uh, follow-ups of uh, some four months to four years. And in the studies were uh, mainly bosentan, but also sildenafil was used or a combination therapy. Um, the longest follow-up was reported by uh, the group of Gatsoulis. It's a study from Dimopoulos um, in the second last line. I will come to this um, study later. To answer the question, if patients will profit from uh, long-lasting from targeted therapy, we ne need longer-term studies, which means a follow-up of years, if not, or better, of decades. This most recently uh, published study examines the efficacy of targeted therapy over a median of 3.3 years. It's published by Dilla uh, last year. It is a retrospective cohort study on 79 Eisenmenger patients. 
showing an early increase in six-minute walk distance, reaching a plateau after about two years, and no obvious trend towards worsening on average during longer-term follow-up. These are data from the same study. You are seeing conditional density plots illustrating the association between a baseline six-minute walk distance walk and improvement in the walking distance in the upper panel and in the functional class in the lower panel. What Diller did was he looked at the um, baseline, yeah, baseline six-minute walk distance and then patients who were very severely affected with the six-minute walk distance of a only about 100 to 200 meters, 100% 100 of patients improved with treatment, yes. But in patients who were, had a better uh, or a longer walking distance at baseline, more than 400 meters, the proportion of patients who did not improve is substantial, it is 60%. And in functional class, the opposite is true. The patients most severely afflicted did not improve in uh, functional class during uh, therapy, whereas patients with a better baseline exercise capacity do improve. So what does it mean? If you are optimistic, you would say, OK, every patient will improve. The severely affected can have a longer walking distance, and the patients with a longer walking distance will improve in functional capacity. If you are pessimistic, you would conclude that no one impro will improve because the patients severely affected do not feel better and the patients who feel better do not have a better exercise capacity. This brings up to the question which endpoints in clinical studies are appropriate to, uh, to prove the efficacy of treatment. Um, let me come to survival. Does targeted therapy improve survival? That is less clear. In this retrospective single center register study, the effect of the therapy on survival was analyzed. This is from the Gatsoulis group. Um, the study was a follow up of about four years, and they observed a survival rate of 77% in patients who are not on therapy. And they compared this group retrospectively with a smaller group of 60 patients on targeted therapy, and the odds ratio for targeted therapy is 0.2. That means they have a substantial survival benefit. The limitation of this study is its retrospective design and the lack of a control group. Therefore, for me, it is not entirely clear of if targeted therapy will improve survival. So what we need is longer follow-ups. And as everybody knows, Nearly a decade ago, a multi-center study on Bosentan in Eisenmenger was conducted in Germany. That was a competence net study. The study had an open-label prospective design and included 60 patients. And it was designed to analyze the effect of six months of treatment with Bosentan. The first patient was included in 2004 and the last in 2007. And if you, and the study was then uh, closed, and it was not part of the protocol um, to uh, have a longer follow-up, but this study gives, up, give, gives us the opportunity to, to have a prospective um, cohort for a longer-term follow-up, and that is what we actually did. We have a mean follow-up now of 6.6 .6 years, and it was the longest follow-up of 10 years in some patients. Okay, what are the results? We, have inc we had included um, 60 patients with a median age of 35 years, and the majority of patients has a simple um, VSD, but also a substantial proportion of patients had uh, complex heart diseases like a pulmonary atresia or transposition. The effect on six-minute walk distance is shown here. You see this is uh, the baseline radius is about 350 meters, and after the half, after six months of treatments, we have a, a significantly increase in walking distance of about 70 meters. And in the longer term follow-up, we have a still a significant increase in this walking distance. It 
the significant lava drops in the group observed three to six years. And in patients who are longer than six years on therapy, we could not observe a significant in increase in walking distance compared to baseline. That brings up, brings up to the, us to the point that Eisenmenger is still a progressive disease, and I think no one will wonder that the walking distance is going down later. The pro BNP levels also drops in the um, first six months of therapy, and thereafter there is no significant um, difference to baseline and the follow up studies with a substantial variation in values. And interestingly, the functional class, which was initially improved significantly, uh, we observed a worsening of functional class early in the course. Uh, in the group observed three years, we have a more patients with functional class two than and three, and this trend uh, holds on for the whole um, follow up. Our survival rate in this group was 80 years after five years and about 70 years after 10 years. So to conclude, targeted therapy is good, but not good enough. So our second mission is reversal of Eisenmenger. 17 years ago, Batista came up with this case report of a 19-year-old female with a ventricular septal defect. And he discovered on, his, uh, on a lung biopsy a Heath Edwards classification grade 4, that is plexiform lesions. The patient had an aortic saturation of 90-70%, and he decided to do a banding with this patient that the saturation comes down to 75%, and after a follow-up of one year, the lung biopsy showed total regression of previous lesions, so was the interpretation of the new biopsy, and he decided to do a corrective surgery. Interestingly, he, this concept was done in, in six more patients, as he stated, with similar positive outcome, and they are awaiting for the definitive procedure. But as, you, as everybody knows, there is no follow-up of this patient published in the last 15 years. So this sounds good, but it's hard to believe. So, however, it is worthwhile to look at the concept of the treat and repair approach in more detail. At birth, we have a patient with uh, a low pulmonary vascular resistance with significant shunt, and no one will doubt that we can uh, correct this patient, this, uh, sorry, this um, heart disease. And on the other extreme of the spectrum, there is a patient with a full-blown Eisenmenger, and no one will think about corrective surgery. But what is with patients who are developing an elevated PVR? Is there a time frame in which an operation is suitable with medical therapy in patients who were formerly judged as inoperable? There are some studies published in the past describing corrective surgery in patients with elevated pulmonary pressure. Um, Fang here on the right side, for instance, proposed um, to use a fenestrated patch with a flap allowing right to left chanting. <laughs> or, um, Huang had a, a concept of diagnostic um, treatment and repair strategy. He uh, first he looked for vasoreagability, and in, if the patient has a response, he decided to um, repair the patient. But all published studies had some limitations, like uh, the lack of a control group or inclusion of very young patients with elevated pulmonary pressure, but normal PVR, and only short um, follow-up. In our claim, and the follow-up is extremely important because recently here, um, published from the, um, from Manir, from, from Belgium, uh, you see the retrospective data, it's from Padua, sorry, it's from Padua, mm -hmm. um, on 190 patients the long-term survival of patients with pulmonary hypertension and corrected congenital heart disease seems to be worse 
initially you see an, this is a, the yellow line is after cardiac defect correction and the black line is the Eisenmenger syndrome who were not corrected. And as you can see in the first five years, there's no difference between groups, but with longer term follow up, you see an, um, sub, a significantly worse outcome in patients who were corrected. So the concept of treat and um, repair was also conducted in our clinic, but we um, only come to a palliation procedure. We have four patients, three with ventricular septal defect and one with an AV channel, which were trans uh, admitted to our hospital at the age of two or four years with an Eisenmenger syndrome, and we decided to do a pulmonary artery bending and put them on targeted therapy. And now we have a 10-year follow-up of these patients, and I can show you our um, data from these patients. On the other panel, you see the saturation, which goes um, initially down with bending, but after that, all patients are cyanotic with saturations between 80 and 90%. The pulmonary vascular resistance index remains high in our patients, and the systolic pulmonary artery pressure is also high, so that we could not decide to correct these patients. So, to conclude, treat and repair may be suitable, if at all, for a minority of patients who better had been operated earlier. So our third mission is heart-lung transplantation. I will just show only one slide, and that is a Kaplan-Meier curve of adult heart-lung transplantation um, published by the International so Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. And what you can see is that the Eisminger patient is a red line that after one year of transplantation, about 70% of um, patients are survived, and we have a 10-year survival with, which is about 33%. And if you compare this data with the natural cause of Eisenmenger, um, you see the dilemma. Um, the challenge of heart-lung transplantation is to identify a patient who is ill enough that survival on targeted therapy is worse than after transplantation, and who is healthy enough that transplantation is still possible without additional risk. That means due to poor survival rates in patients with Eisenmenger, heart-lung transplantation is optional only in highly selected cases. So let me come to our vision. Will we tame the shrew in Eisenmenger syndrome? The answer is yes, for a while. And there are some good news for, for Europe and US. The number of adult patients will drop. That can be seen in difficulties in recruiting patients for ongoing clinical trials. And the incidence in children is extremely low. But in the developing world, uncorrected CHD is still common. To overcome this problem is not a question of pharmaceutical intervention. It is a political and social issue. Thank you for your attention.